people like me. You need people like me so you can point your fucking fingers and say that's the bad guy. That's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this. Another installment in the annual Ring IQ talent search. Our next installment takes us to Edmonton, Canada. Where a young Canadian fighter of Polish descent definitely has my attention. A young fighter that goes by the name Alexas Kubitsky. Alexas Kubitsky, who sports a professional record of five wins, no losses and no draws, no recorded knockouts, not yet. A very young fighter with a very high ceiling, only 19 years old. Oh. Upon viewing the footage of Alexas Kubitsky, I was taken aback by how balanced and how well-schooled how put together this young fighter is. How fluid. Campaigning in the women's flyweight division. Flyweight, that's where Marlon Esparza currently reigns as the unified WBA and WBC champion. Mexico's own Areli Musinho. She's got the IBF and Argentina's own Gabriela Alaniz. She's got the WBO. A talent-rich division like many talent-rich divisions in the lower weights. And Alexas Kubitsky represents the next wave of talented young fighters campaigning at or around these weights. Alexas Kubitsky debuted as a professional in June of last year, and she's already seen action five times since then. That's the kind of schedule that a young fighter is supposed to be on. In the early stages of a fighter's career, it's not uncommon to see them fight three, four, maybe even five times in a single calendar year to get those rounds in the bank and garner. I mean, ideally, that's what you want. You want that fighter fighting often, garnering that professional experience and banking as many rounds as they can. I have to say, when I viewed the footage of Alexas Kubitsky in action, I was thoroughly impressed. Her usage of the lead hand, the way she keeps it working, keeps it out there, sets up punches with it, and simultaneously disrupts the opponent. Her lateral movement in the pocket, the way she's able to turn her opponent while beating those feet. Moving that head, moving that torso. Slipping, rolling, and riding punches to take something off of the punches, to take something off of the shots, encountering in kind. And that body attack. Alexas Kubitsky has no recorded knockouts at this time, not yet. She's a very young fighter. So she might not be right now the puncher that she can be after 10 professional fights and 15 professional fights. But I really like what I see so far. Does seem to be some mustard on those shots, tactically. Technically, she's very good, very balanced. A mid-range to inside fighter that throws fluid combinations and keeps the jab working. It's all off the jab. The most important punch in boxing. Alexos is definitely a mid-range to inside fighter, not an outside jabber. But not just a brawler, not just a mauler either. Base style is almost a crossbreed, a, a hybrid style of a boxer puncher and a pressure fighter. The fact that she stays with and stays on top of the opponent. But she's not just winging punches. It's not volume for the sake of volume. These are educated shots, educated punches, fluid combinations. Defensively, she's very good. Offensively, she's gifted. She's really something. There's supposed to be some fight news pending for Alexas Kubitsky, who definitely has my attention. A fighter exhibit in this kind of ceiling at this age, at only 5-0, and oh, has the luxury of time. I mean, I don't think Alexas handlers should be in any kind of hurry to corner world title fights championship matches. She's got all the time in the world to continue to bank those rounds and develop, fully hone her skills as she maturates. There's no rush. There shouldn't be. Alexas, by way of her own social media, seems to have some big fight news pending. Curious to see what it is, what it will be. But if nothing else, this kid's a winner. This kid's one of Ring IQ's top prospects to watch in the year of 2023. And I look forward to seeing what the future holds for Alexos Kubitsky. What? Another thing we're going to change about these fight about getting his money. Stop getting his money when it's over. You got to pay me after the time the fight is over with. 
That's what other fight got to get to, too. And waiting and all that. Because any other business shit, after the job done, we want your money. We ain't want to wait no month or two weeks or three. We need it now. That's another thing that needs to be changed. Those sound bites from former WBC heavyweight champion Deontay Wilder sound eerily similar to the sound bites we heard from Adrian Bronier upon leaving the shores of PBC Island and washing up on the shores of Black Prime. We talked about it here on the channel how Adrian Broner told Sean Porter that at Black Prime, he didn't have to wait for his money for weeks on end, months on end, years on end. Not only you get 40%, but you get 40% on that Monday. Ooh. Okay. Not not no six months. We gotta wait till the till the numbers come in. Not no eight, eight, not no year. Stop getting this money. When it's over, you gotta pay me after the time the fight is over with. We didn't wanna wait no month or two weeks or three. We need it now. That's another thing that needs to be changed. For the longest time, there's been widespread rumors and speculation that Al Heyman isn't paying these guys their full purses over there on PBC Island. And, you know, Deontay Wilder, he's a PBC fighter. He's been with the PBC for as long as I can remember. His gripes and his issues sound a lot like the issues that Adrian Bronier raised. When he was still over there. Text correspondence that he uploaded to his then Instagram channel, AB the Wave God. Text correspondence between himself and what was supposed to be Al Heyman. Demanding that Al Heyman give him the rest of his money. That he doesn't want to have a conversation about it. Just give the man his money. In the comments of that Instagram post, you saw former PBC fighter Hugo Centeno agreeing with Adrian and stating that's the reason he left. That's a part of the reason he left the PBC. They weren't giving the fighters their entire purses in a timely fashion. Coincidentally, Deontay Wilder's singing a familiar tune, but he's still with the PBC that he's been with for years. He doesn't fight under any other banner. He doesn't work with anyone else. He is a PBC fighter. Thus, the situation he's describing... It's his own situation. Which is the exact same kind of situation that Adrian Broner was describing over a year ago in August of 2021. It's the same shit. Now, if you can believe this, there are actually people that struggle with this, that struggle with the notion that perhaps Al Heyman isn't all he's been made out to be. He's been deified in some circles, very small ones, as some sort of boxing fairy godmother. Like he's not just another boxing guy. Weiss, he's actually Weiss. He's a music guy who transitioned into being a boxing guy, a boxing guy of sorts, a recluse. Because there are no crooks in the music industry, right? There are no crooks in the sport of boxing, no crooks in the business of boxing. And is it that these individuals refuse to accept that maybe Al Heyman's a crook? Maybe he's just another boxing guy. Maybe he's not the deity that they've made him out to be due to the success that he had alongside Floyd Mayweather. I've long maintained that Al Heyman's role in Floyd Mayweather's career and his success is often overstated because Floyd was a generational talent and Al Heyman, he didn't groom him. Bob Arum did. Over there at top rank, by the time Al came into it, he was already a finished product. Already a complete fighter, a pound for pound talent. Thus, no grooming process was necessary. Al Heyman capitalized off the work and the finance that top rank poured into Floyd. He didn't build him. He's not capable of building fighters. He's only capable of bilking fighters. Bilking fighters like Hugo Centeno, Adrian Broner, Deontay Wilder. They're the ones complaining. Do you think you know something about their finances that they don't ask yourself? Why are they complaining? Why are they all singing the same tune? Why is Al Heyman paying these guys in increments instead of giving them their full purses? Is that standard practice at the PBC? Because according to former champion Antonio Tarver, the magic man, that's not standard practice throughout. That's not universally practiced in the sport. Antonio Tarver caught wind of these sound bites from Deontay Wilder and asked, I've been out of the game too long. Who ain't getting paid immediately after the fight? Where do they do that at? The PBC, that's where. PBC Island. The Hamanites. The guys who vehemently defend Al Heyman, who they don't know from Adam. They never stop to ask themselves, why would Deontay Wilder, after losing that second fight to Tyson Fury, come out and say that he was offered more money to fight Anthony Joshua than what he stood to make fighting Fury? Why don't they ask themselves? If Deontay is admitting this, why didn't Al Heyman just have Deontay sign on the dotted line? He's admitting to zone off at him more money. So if that's true, what advice was he given that day? Because whatever it was, it wasn't to his benefit. It was to his 
detriment. And this is the conflict of interest. This is what happens when you're both manager, advisor, and promoter. Oh, I know that Al Heyman's not a promoter by name, by title, but he sure brokers deals with networks like a promoter, doesn't he? He brokers his own deals with TV networks the same way a promoter would, the same way Bob Arum did with ESPN, the same way Eddie Hearn did with Sky Sports, which subsequently became DAZN, the same as Frank Warren in Queensbury. It's against the Ali Act to have that kind of agamonical control over a fighter, over an athlete, and he circumvents it behind the title of advisor. But you tell me what kind of situation it is where these guys work for their advisor. Their advisor is supposed to be working for them, not the other way around. He's advising fighters, managing fighters, and simultaneously promoting fighters. And the conflict of interest that that raises is you can't look out for your broadcast partner's best interests at the same time you look out for your fighter's best interests. Sometimes those two aren't the same thing. What might be good for the network might not be good for the fighter. You're trying to keep all the content on your broadcast partner's side of the street even if there's more money for your fighter on some other side of the street. In the case of Deontay Wilder, DeZone the had more money for him than he stood to make fighting Fury again. But who did he end up fighting? He fought Fury again. Adam Kovnowski, like Deontay Wilder, was made an offer to come over to DeZone and box Anthony Joshua. That offer was shot down. The same applies to Luis Ortiz. And you tell me if those guys ended up making the money in those fights that they could have made opposite the ring, Anthony Joshua. You know they didn't. You think they gave Adam Kovnowski millions upon millions of dollars to box Chris Ariola? What are you, fucking stupid? Because after he was taken out of the running for a Joshua fight, you know that's who he ended up fighting. He ended up fighting Chris Ariola on FS1. And you're telling me that that was more important than boxing Anthony Joshua for three alphabet titles and what could have been a multi-million dollar purse. Win or lose. The Hamanites are too stupid to see the forest through the trees. You guys are too fucking stupid, man. They think that Al Heyman's their fairy godmother? They think he would never. They don't ask themselves, why is what Deontay Wilde is saying here and now sound just like what Adrian Broner was saying a few weeks ago? What he's been harping about for well over a year now. Why would Al Heyman not be giving these guys their entire purses? What the hell is he doing with their money? Is he giving these guys an allowance? It sounds like it, and it's for that reason that Adrian Broner decided to leave the island. And dropping a few hints as to What's really going on over there? It's not the land of milk and honey that some make it out to be. Those who are willfully misinformed and obtuse. What do you think this guy is, your prodigal fucking father? He's a boxing guy like any other fucking boxing guy. You're just the bozos that deified him. Put simply, there are those out there who want Al Heyman to be more than what he actually is. All he is, is another boxing guy. Another crook. And finally, the David Benavidez versus Caleb Plant WBC interim title fight finally has an official date set to go down in late March on the 25th via Showtime pay-per-view. The winner of the fight, whoever it is, will in effect become Canelo Alvarez's WBC mandatory challenger. Most are going with David Benavidez to stop Caleb Plant. Mostly because... Caleb Plant, he's been stopped before. We all saw it in late 2021 when he shared the ring. Canelo Alvarez, a naturally smaller fighter and a smaller man than David Benavidez, albeit a more accomplished fighter, a more ambitious fighter than David Benavidez. All the same, we've seen Caleb get stopped before, and it's possible that he could get stopped again. And that's the problem with letting somebody else come along and do your homework for you. That's it. You had the opportunity to take this guy's O and take this guy's belt in 2019, but your promoter wanted to wait. He wanted to let the fight marinate. As a result of that, we all know what happened. David lost his title on the scales. Eventually, Canelo Alvarez cornered a fight with Caleb, and he ended up being the first one to stop him. So now, Caleb getting stopped, well, now it seems entirely possible, where before, it was a battle of the unbeatens, the unbeaten fighters, the unbeaten champions in their primes. It's battle of the former champions, and one of them, at least one of them, has been stopped before. Thus, him getting stopped again seems entirely possible. Could that affect the buy rate of the pay-per-view? Of course it could. That in tandem with how many other pay-per-views are set to be going down in sequence month to month, you've got this pay-per-view in March, you've got the Gervonta Davis versus Ryan Garcia fight set to go down the following month in April, unless we forget Devin Haney versus Vasil Lomachenko. That's in May. And Spence versus Thurman, and Canelo Alvarez's eventual ring return. And whenever they decide to schedule 
Wilder versus Ruiz, which will likely be in the summer. It's a lot of box office fights. It's a lot of pay-per-views. They're oversaturating the market with box office fights. My honest take is that this looks more like the co-main event to a main event. This would better service a Spence versus Thurman card or the Wilder versus Ruiz card as a titillating co-main event to a main event. But not a main event unto itself. I mean, it's not even a full title fight. It's for an interim title. You get better fights than this that don't cost you $75. Some better and some that are just as good. They're all the same. They don't come with that hefty pay-per-view price tag. To many, it seems all but a foregone conclusion that David Benavidez is going to eventually walk down and stop Caleb Plant due to what our Caleb Plant's perceived gas tank issues. That he might start off all right, beating his feet and working off the counter, attempting to walk David Benavidez into shots. Might start off all right in the early goings of the match while he's fresh, though does he really have enough pop in those shots to keep David Benavidez off of him? And how good is that shoulder roll of his, really? Caleb Plant is thought of as a more defensive fighter, a more finesse than ferocity kind of guy, and that's what he is. It's not uncommon to see him really get mocked up in fights whilst rolling punches off the shoulder. Pace of the match may end up getting to Caleb. David Benavidez being a mid-range to inside combination puncher, a pressure guy, a statuesque one. Keeping him out and staying on the outside of that guy's shots may wear on Caleb Plant's gas tank. And if it does... He couldn't keep a smaller fighter, a smaller target out in Canelo Alvarez. So how's he gonna keep David out? For David, he's got to stay in character. He's got to show and prove. In many ways, this is the best fighter he will have fought so far. And if he's to keep this air... If he wants to keep that reputation of his, that he's this Mexican monster, he better live up to expectations. He better stop this guy. Though most people think that he can, and most people think that he will, because I reiterate, they've seen Caleb Plant get stopped before. So him getting stopped again is entirely possible. David stays in character and becomes the WBC's mandatory challenger. I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't mind seeing him share the ring with Canelo Alvarez later on in the year on the premise that I'm not actually excited to see Canelo share the ring with Dimitri Bivol for a second time. I'd much rather see this fight. I don't want to see Dimitri drop down a super metal weight. He did what he did against Canelo Alvarez, and for Canelo, there's no shame in that. I'd rather see him defend the undisputed crown against this guy on the premise that this guy's actually more beatable and more basic than Dimitri Bivol. Most of what you see David Benavidez do when he gets out there, he's doing because these guys can't do nothing about it. The quality of competition is so poor. So pedestrian, it's actually that much easier for him to get out there and look like a quote-unquote monster. I honestly think Canelo Alvarez should take care of this guy. Just feel like he's more beatable than Dimitri Bivol.